that this house we're going to talk about was possibly used as a hiding place for escaping slaves. In, let's see, 1849, there was a deed uh, executed for a quarter acre of land of Enoch Lewis's, right down on the corner of what was then the Gap Newport Pike and New Garden Road. And he sold it to a group of men, local Quaker farmers, who wanted to build a Lyceum Hall or Lyceum House. I see it called both. And uh, these men paid Enoch Lewis a quarter of an acre of land. And, and this, when, when it was actually executed, that was the date of the deed. In a year, they, they had built this small frame building. And uh, uh, ever after, the Lyceum House was controlled, if you will, by a, an attempt to provide cultural and educational, adult education, through the Middle Atlantic States, New England, and the Middle West, never went to the South. It was very, very popular. Speakers, uh, entertainers followed the Lyceum circuit. I'm, I'm Dr. Margaret Jones. Um, I was a, as an undergraduate in college, I was a history major, so I've always been interested in history. When I retired 20 years ago, I became interested in New Garden history, and in the course of this time, I've made myself the local historian, particularly because I love houses. So I'm no, so many of the old houses in the township are known as Peg's houses, just because I'm so fond of them and I mourn when they aren't a, we aren't able to preserve them. In in the in the course of um, studying the old houses, I got interested in a man named Enoch Lewis. Um, born in 1776, the date you can remember. Mm. Um, and he was a teacher. He taught at West Town School initially. He was a math mathematician. But his wife inherited this house, and they doubled it in size and made it into a boys' boarding school, they called it. Now, our Lyceum Hall existed as a Lyceum for about 30 years. Uh, in 18, I think it was 1887, 1888, uh, it was sold, all, sold to the New Garden Township. Joel, uh, George Thompson at that point was the trustee. His name is on the deed. And the township used it for a school initially. Uh, we had lots of one-room schools that went to grade six. and. This was a high school, grade seven and eight, in the Lyceum House. Um, township meetings were held there, the Board of Supervisors met there, and it was also a polling place. It's where everybody in the township came to vote. Um, and that continued until 19, the voting continued till 1966. Uh, the school became too small, became crowded, and they built the adjoining house that became uh, Charles Williams house um, to replace it and then the grades went to 10th grade and that but that only lasted for about mm, 10 or 15 years uh, because then there were high schools built in Avondale. Now, Truman Cooper lived on Ellicott Avenue. Truman Cooper remem remembered as one of the leading speakers because they had debates. That was a very very popular form of entertainment in the late 19th century. And here are some of the topics. The use of tobacco and rum is not only useless, but in every, in every way uh, causes an incalculable amount of evil. And that was a debate topic. Another one, the nine-tenths of all poverty, misery, ignorance, and drunkenness, and a still greater proportion of all offenses against our laws, such as robbery, larceny, arson, burglary, manslaughter, and murder, are occasioned by women being denied the right to vote. So the issues, people are always interested when anyone says Underground Railroad, people's eyes light up. And Enoch, Enoch Lewis 
Because Enoch Lewis had a brother in Wilmington who was an avid abolitionist and a friend of William Garrett's, who was a famous uh, Underground Railroad station master, um, Lewis felt that it, one should not encourage slaves to escape because it was too dangerous. Too many of them died trying to escape. But he never denied any slaves' uh, safety if his brothers Fast sent them forward to. to 1966. I remember one evening when Bob Taylor, who was the chairman of the Board of Supervisors, uh, came to see us, sat in our living room, and the discussion was, what shall we do with the Lyceum House? Uh, shall we sell it? We're not using it. They had purchased uh, another building uh, down on Route 41 to use for a township um, office for set up for meetings and a place to park there more than 50 years ago. New Garden Township was very different from the township it is today. It was all rural, it was rural, all farm families. Uh, people were busy, physically busy. Farming is a physical activity. You work with your head, but you work a lot with your hands. And coming together in the churches, in the meeting house, and in the schools seemed to be enough for people. There wasn't any, any sense that we need a community center. The idea of women taking a couple of hours in the afternoon going for a yoga class was heresy, unheard of. Um, so, so just to give you an idea of how, how different life was, so we could not come up with any idea. I mean, we, we thought of a community center, but we thought who would use it. And so uh, it was put out to bid. And Charlie, uh, Charles, I guess he's known as, Charles Williams, the neighbor, bought it for a little less than 3500 And so it was sold. Uh, and Mr. Williams used it as storage, and the township no longer had any interest in it. Um, and then Mr. Williams died. His daughter moved into the house. The family changed. They wanted a lawn, and they had this building that uh, Mr. Williams had taken care of. He had painted it, he'd put a new roof on it, he'd planted a row of pine trees along the, the side of the road to sort of buffer it, uh, but his family was no, was no longer able or willing to take care of a building that they didn't use and offered it to the township. And that was probably five years ago. And nothing happened. Just nothing happened. People talked about it, but nothing happened. And then, about a year and a half ago, Mrs. Williams called the township and asked if a couple of the supervisors would come and talk to her about it, because she was going to have it. And so it was just happenstance that Bobby Parati walked into that building to inspect it. And he looked around and he said, this building is in such good shape and we need a community center at the park, and this building will fill, fit the bill. So he put, he put his plans in motion. It took a while, uh, but he, fa he found a mover. And then just last summer, we had a contractor uh, come to look at the, Lambert, at the roof of the kitchen in the Lambert house, and uh, Joe Yasko said, let's go look at the Lyceum house. I wonder if we can drop the roof, if we can move it without having to move any wires. It's going to be very expensive to have all the wires moved. And the carpenter, whose name was Chris King, said indeed he could do that. And he's the one you see in your video who's standing up on the roof. And they, so they dropped the two uh, peaks, the two the gable, the gable ends, they just simply dropped them down, took them off, put the roof down, wrapped it up, and off it went. And because he could do that, it meant that there was enough money in that budget to put shingle, sh shingle, cedar shingles back on the roof instead of some asphalt or something else. So the house is now in place. I go down.
Taking the metal off the, uh, taking the screws out, backing the metal out. Um, okay, tear down. couple pieces of tin off and we'll stand up on the ceiling there. There's a ceiling in there and we'll just work our way across. Loosen it up. Should go pretty easy. And what tools are you using to take the roof off right uh, now? Just a default uh, screw gun. Just a, a screw, a sheet screw in there and packing that thing out. How's it working Chris? Hey it's going real good. Yep, it's going good, coming off real nice. Are you seeing any problems with the roof that you didn't expect? Any unexpected? Yeah, it's gone better than I thought, actually. It'll just all right. come off, lay down, put back together very easy. Not going to be any problem at so, all. So the stripped of wood going horizontally across the roof, you're just going to discard them then? Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the lath that's on where the metal is fastened, it's going to come off. It'll be a new uh, OSB put on. Okay. It's going to be shingled. Up there with the fireplace, that is a with bit the chimney, shaky, almost wanted to fall. Over. And, and so, what would you do to protect something like that? Well, we just put a prop in and we're gonna take it down piece by piece, rather than all in one shot, ready to fall over, pretty much. And so, what's going on with this fire, with this uh, fire um, chimney over here? What's he doing with that? Just, it's just a demo job. Tear it down piece by piece, yeah. You let the brick just sit up there. You throw it. No, nah, we'll throw them down. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't think you want to save any of them. They got plastered, so. Gonna throw them away, put them on a pile. And I saw you over here, you're putting like a shim up for the wall. Yeah, just a brace just to make sure it doesn't fall out. I guess we'll try to mark them. One, two, three, four, five. Mark the rafters. We'll try to get them back there or the same place we took them out of. Will that make mark, the, mark the collar ties. Will that make it easier for you when you reassemble? Well, I, I think it might, yeah out and lay them down they're real easy they'll just uh, maybe take a saw on cut the nails or pull the nails out whichever goes easier lay them down put them on a trailer and truck them over to your new place uh, I think that uh, they've done very well for the, the amount of time they've been here and it seems like it's gone very well uh, I was I was surprised that they got so much done uh, so quickly Siding at the splice, and then just pull them off and lay them down, and try to slide them down to the ground. Well, you're going to help. <laughs> I'm going to lay it down now. Just lay it down and then lift it to the ground. So it's a simple cut with the. Uh, well, with I don't the, even know we need a cut. I'm just going to cut that lath. It's it's kind of binding the two together, holding the two together. So I'm just going to put a cut in that lath up there. And then it'll just lay down on its own? Just lay down, that's what we're hoping, yeah. Look out! I thought that the, uh, the rafters that the, uh, came out of the uh, roof seem to be in considerably good shape for uh, as old as they are. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to put them all back and uh, keep them in the uh, original set as they were. I saw you looking at the the overhang the, the um in the front. What 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 are your thoughts about that? Well, it, I, I want to make sure it takes the ride down the road. Uh, I think we're going to take it off just to make sure that uh, that the um, doesn't get damaged in the move. So uh, we'll, we'll have the contractor take that off and then uh, install it back when we get it back to the site. Now that the roof has been removed, the rafters salvaged the gables laid to the attic floor, 
it is time to begin the process in lifting the house to move it to its new location. My name is Jamin Buckingham. We move structures, large and small, for a, that's what we do for full-time work. Um, mainly on the East Coast, we get into the Midwest, some, and out into the West. We move uh, approximately about 60 houses or structures and raise about 80 to uh, roughly 80 structures a year, just raising for foundation replacements or out of flood zones, um, to, to up out of water's way, harm's way during a flood. What's the largest size by weight home you moved? 900, real close to 900 ton. And how much the house that we're moving today weigh? 28 ton. The process of moving a building um, starts obviously in the planning and the thinking stage, um, doing the route survey, making sure that utilities um, are out of way or either if they're not, you know, what it takes to move that utility, um, whether it be a line, a traffic light. But once that step, that process is done, um, equipment's loaded at the yard, we're mobilizing to the job site. Um, once we arrive at the site, um, in this case, with this particular structure, we had to excavate around the perimeter of it so that we have enough room to uh, insert, place our steel underneath. So we excavate around the structure, we put the holes through the foundation, and here in this case they were a stone wall, approximately two foot thick, um, old rubble stone with um, brittle mortar. Over the years it turned soft. Put the uh, insert the steel. The mains go in first. Cross beams. Everything is raised with a unified hydraulic jacking machine. And once that is raised up, we go. We take a. In this case, we took a snout on front of the skid steer and leveled out underneath that area underneath it. We could uh, so we can back the trailer underneath and lower it onto the trailer. And at that point, we're loaded and it's a matter of driving it down the road. The beams weigh? Yeah, these, uh, the main beams weigh 68 pounds a foot, and the cross beams are 54 pounds a foot. The skid steer proved its value throughout the entire project. From excavating around the house, to punching the holes through the foundation of the house, and to use the snout to dig underneath the foundation of the house. Using the snout, the skid steer was able to remove several, several hundred pounds of rock from underneath the foundation of the house, something that could not have been done any other way. So how high do you need to get, how deep do you need to get? Uh, for a jacks, we need four feet. Wow. Four feet, wow. Just where the jack is. You know. Hitting a lot of rock right now, is that the problem? Yeah. Trying to build the pile about 22 inches from here to the top of the pile. Where the bottom is right now really doesn't matter. It's plenty deep. I think it has to be 44 inches, and right now he's got yeah he's got 49. So I know the pile's plenty deep. So you're set with the you're set with your measurements that you've taken. Yeah. So now what what are the next steps that you'll do? Well, the next step is to build a base out of crib. I run three running this way. And I run three on this side. And then I'll just start building the block up. Put the foundation in, right? Yep, we built the foundation and we got our crib stacked up on steel up here. The, uh, the pile not only serves as a spot to a jack, but we'll put a roller on top of here and we get our steel, we'll set it on the roller and it helps. Nah, 
no, no. Yeah. There we go. Now that the excavation has been completed around the meeting house, it is time to start moving the I-beams under the structure. Using the skid steer to lift and then guide the I-beams onto the first roller, it is then a matter of gently guiding the two main I-beams the width of the home into their final position. So when you start lifting with this hydraulics, yes. will will it will the house is it the, the weight of the house is felt with the hydraulics? Will it bury these uh, six by five and a halves? Uh, they'll compress a little bit, but now they're pretty much there. They're not moving. No, they will not move. All right, how far out are you from lifting the house? Well, we have to push across steel in yet and shim everything up, so it's gonna be. Maybe two hours, I'm thinking. And then you'll be lifting it? Yeah, we'll definitely be lifting it today. place shimming is it's shimmed up between the steel and the structure any variation of um, any elevation variation that there is in the structure is taken out with them shims uh, one inch two inch and wedges so once when it's all shimmed up the jacking is raised with a unified hydraulic jack machine and it was raised three foot adequate enough that we could um, back our trailer underneath the structure to set it down onto the trailer I'm the Parks and Recreation Director for New Garden Township. I'm in charge of the park and all of the programs that we do here. Right now we are in the process of moving our Lyceum house into the park. Um, last evening they took out the foundation, locked it up, lifted it, and moved a flatbed truck underneath of it, and then dropped it onto the flatbed truck and pulled it out and sat it in the driveway for movement this morning. Um, the whole process of the move, it was a long time getting here, but it's finally here and now it seems to be happening in the blink of an eye. Everything is happening so fast and just amazing. Down Route 41 went very well. It's nice, um, wide open for the most part. The utility lines, we were right there for height, so the light um, had to be lifted up about an inch, inch and a half, just 
assisted over the roof, but it went very well. Andres, Interim Township Manager. Actually, uh, my involvement came rather late. Uh, the planning had, for the most part, been done. I helped with the uh, final contracts and board approval for the move, and uh, final coordination with the police and things of that sort. So what are your feelings today, seeing the house here ready to be placed into its new home? Oh, I think it's exciting. Um, to see an old structure like this uh, moved and relocated into a heavily used area of the township right here in the middle of the park. I think it's very good. I'm Alabanda. I am a township supervisor for New Garden Township. My, my involvement with this project has been uh, limited a lot of the credit should go to Supervisor Bob Parati who has sort of taken this project and led it from when it was over there to, to here today. Um, and I, I supported the, uh, the move of this, um, the foresight for the future for the township um, and to preserve the historical uh, lyceum. Pulling it into the new site, um, grading in front of the foundation, leveling a pad off, what we'll do so that when we pull it up there, we're setting halfway level for when we set our roll beams to roll it over the new foundation. And, and the corner of the house didn't quite make it over the foundation. You had to do a little extra work. Can you tell me what happened there? Um, when we made the corner, when we were making the corner, it was pretty, it, we were coming down the hill and turning at the same time. So our trailer, because it was such a lean, the, the ground terrain was so uneven there. What we did is we took the snout and dug out on the high side so it would level up so that we could clear it. So what are you trying to do right now? Trying to lift up one side and take down another? Yeah, try to lift up on one side. Is that because of the, the, uh, the, the little lip on that house is not making repair yeah, on the foundation? Yeah, it's just on the hill and the whole thing's leaning down too far. Okay, so the turn was good. Yeah, it's the, just turn, that, the, the, the turn trailer was good. Sunk. It's just that it's sitting lower than we thought it was.
After removing earth from the high side of the trailer and adding wood to the low side, Team Wolf was ready to move the meeting house into its final staging position. By using the skid steer to lift the back of the flatbed, the house was on the move again. Now that the meeting house was in its final staging position, Team Wolf began laying 5x6 railroad ties under the home while it was still on the trailer. The hydraulic jacking system will be used to lift the meeting house off the trailer. Once this is completed, the, the trailer will be able to drive away, leaving the house freestanding just outside the foundation. Once the trailer is moved from under the meeting house, Team Wolf will begin moving the 50-foot I-beams into position. Once in position, they will begin sliding the home over the foundation. It is critical that all of Team Wolf is monitoring the sliding of the I-beams into position as the slightest miscalculation could send the 3,400-pound I-beams into the 5x6 railroad ties, knocking them over. If this would occur, the meeting house could easily become unbalanced, falling to the ground. Once the I-beams are put into place, the industrial rollers are put into position. The rollers will be used to assist in sliding the meeting house over the foundation. Clamps are secured to the I-beams in front of the rollers, ensuring the house will not move once the upper beam is lowered onto the roller. What you are watching right now is time-lapse video. For the next minute and a half, you'll see the house move across the 50-foot beams to its final resting position before being lowered onto the foundation. The actual process to move the house across the 50-foot beams took several hours by Team Wolf, as they all were underneath the house monitoring the movement, ensuring that the house moved equally across the foundation to its final position before it would be lowered onto the foundation.
inch and a half in. My sealed overhang is inch and a half. Not even. About two inch, two and Three, a half. Three, four inch. inches. Four inches. Right, let's clamp it off on this side too. Preciseness, is this sort of standard for what you do when you set the house, get ready to set it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's real standard. It's just getting getting within that inch or two? Yep. or yep. Will it become more exact as you start to lower it later? Um, or you try to make it exact right now? We try to make it exact on this so we don't have to mess with it once we start lowering it. Um, sometimes we do. We do have to. But, but that's not your goal. How's that? That's not your goal. Yeah, right. Okay. We normally try and get it. So Ben, what's going to happen next once the agreed upon positioning is? Uh, next thing is to cut the sill where we put our jacks and then we'll flip those toe jacks upside down or around the end we will, we'll flip them upside down and we'll push up against the sill. We'll no. put 12 of them. Now yep. will, they, will you have to use some of this foundation, the wood foundation stuff for that? Or? Uh, I don't think so. Hopefully not. Hopefully we'll just set it right on the wall and go right up against the house. Gotcha. And we'll pick it up. Pull everything out, set it down. Is there anything? Do you secure that, or is that that's it? No, that's, that's it. That's it right there. And it has all the hydraulics within it to lift yep. it. It pushes up. We uh, we'll put piece out against the wall so that it's level, so that when you pick it up, it don't it don't shift on you. Once you have weight on it, ain't going in there. So is the house set at this point? How's that? The house is set at this point on the new yeah, yep. support, the so you're going to start breaking everything? Jacks. So you'll yep. start breaking it down? Yeah, yep. Yeah. We're taking everything out right now. With the tow jacks now around the perimeter of the house, holding the weight of the house, Team Wolf was able to remove all of the steel from underneath the house, leaving the house solely resting on the tow jacks. What you're watching now is, is approximately one and a half minutes in length at fast motion. 
the house being lowered onto its final resting spot, the foundation. How did it end up? We're, we're, we're down, right? Yes, it's on the foundation. It's, everything's but, resting on the foundation. And how are you so, feeling about the move? Is it all good? Good, yeah. It, was a, nice it is very enjoyable taking something that was built in the 1800s, moving it to a new location, preserving it, and um, it's very um, rewarding when you come back in a year and they have it all restored. If you had an architect draw this building exactly as it had been built in the 1800s, and took it in and submitted it as plans for a building permit that would tell you that the building won't stand unless you reinforce it with all kinds of steel and columns and hurricane straps and a number of things that we've added over the years. It's always interesting to see how things actually do last uh, the way that they, they were done in the old days. fours next to them to get them straight again because uh, over the years the roof had bellied and bowed and uh, we used the 2x4s to get our roof line straight again and a few spots where you see me cutting up the old rafter they had a hump in them and uh, originally they had been just notch where the lath had been before and we had put a continuous row of plywood on so I needed to cut that down to get a, a straight plane again. buildings is is very interesting to see the way that things were done uh, back in the, in the days of our grandfathers it, I'm very fortunate that we have power tools and uh, I don't have to have arms that are this big to work a handsaw all day and uh, to uh, to hammer all my nails I, I, I have a lot of luxury in, in that I can use a nail gun uh, we have uh, tapes that uh, are even it, tape measures and squares have changed over the years. Everything's a lot different than it used to be, but uh, it's it's nice to get into restoring a traditional building and keep a, a, a traditional style. Yeah, I always enjoyed it. I have done a number of old buildings that were uh, disassembled and moved to a new location. It's always interesting to see how it was put together and, and how they did things and how it has changed over the years. Uh, now, this building here had uh, wooden pegs uh, put together that way. Um, you know, we, not too many buildings are built that way. And, and this building has lasted since the 1850s and is still uh, in, in decent shape. It needs, needs some work to keep it from, from uh, deteriorating, but you know, it, it's interesting to me to see and to work on this type of building. beneath the shingle so that they can breathe. Wood products 
gather moisture and they hold it and they need a way to release it and the only way to release it is to have air under it. Traditionally the shingles were put on on lath. Uh, this is a newer method that makes it go faster and attached to plywood rather than lath. It makes your building stronger. Now is that more tar paper he's putting on that little line? That, yeah, it's, a, it's an interlaced system of uh, paper that rides above the top edge of the shingle. It creates a continuous layer down onto the bottom layer where we have our ice and water shield which is impervious to water. So that if any water ever does make it down between a shingle, it hits tar paper, rides down, drops, hits tar paper, rides down, hits tar paper, and there's a continuous layer of that down onto the ice and water shield and then out. But your shingle's doing the majority of the work. Is that the right word to use? The, yeah. the way you pick the shingles, uh, you're, you're picking certain ones, obviously for certain reasons. Why is that? They're random width shingles. Uh, some are wider, some are narrower, and you want to have it gapped. You want to be staggered over top of the gap that's below about an inch and a half minimum. So you have to get a shingle that's going to land somewhere in the next one from where you're starting at and not too close to the, to the, um, to the groove that you've left by spacing the shingles. You have to space the ones uh, that you're putting on about a quarter inch uh, between each shingle so they'll expand because they're going to expand when they get moist. And you don't want them to be right butted up because then they'll buckle. So you leave a little bit of a gap. And you have to cover over from where the last one started, a quarter inch gap, cross over the, the, the gap that's on the row below, and land somewhere in the middle of the next shingle. There are a lot of kinds of wood shingles. So it's, a, it's a very traditional material. They've been made out of oak, they've been made out of cedar, and they've been made out of uh, cypress. Cypress is about the best uh, material you can use as a wood shingle. George Washington's house at Mount Vernon has uh, cypress, uh, hand-cut cypress shingles on them. They've all got a little uh, scallop on the bottom of them. And most of them are original from when he lived there. They last a long, long time. Better than slate in most cases. Uh, and, and very minor care. They have to get painted every so many years, but they, they last and last. They've got their own uh, natural uh, protection from insects. Uh, insects can't chew into that type of wood. Cedar is a, a sim has a similar property to it where insects can't damage it. Um, oak is a, actually a very durable material for shingles. Uh, also, it'll last, you can get a year, about what, 25, 30 years from what I saw at the demonstration. Um, and and they, there's a lot of different ways you can have shingles. These are all milled shingles. They've been cut on a, um, a circular type uh, mill. They've been cut. Uh, the traditional way of making shingles was a hand split shake. You had a tool called a fro. Uh, you, you get a split of log. You, you take a, a wedge and drive a, a small split out of it. And then you would take your fro, which is a thin blade, facing down on a long handle and you would drive it in with a mallet and then just twist the handle and sort of split the along the length of your uh, of, of your length of log. So you cut your log as long as you wanted your shingle, you can split and then uh, and you can make them pretty smooth. And a lot of people think that that's where everybody used to stop, that that's uh, the quality that you, you see a lot of people try and make something look old by putting on a hand split cedar shake. but Generally, in the old days, they actually cared about what they were doing when they did it. So they would take that hand split, they'd put it down on a uh, like a bodger's bench. It's a, a bench that you sit on. It's got a clamp, uh, a foot pedal, and you would use a draw knife and smooth that shingle out so that when you put it up there, they were a consistent thickness. They were all smooth. They in laid. the days to come, the Lyceum House is once again going to be able to serve as a gathering place for people in the community. Uh, the downstairs, which of course is new, the, uh, the foundation, uh, is 
an activity is a big room that can be used as an activity room for the for recreational programs. It'll provide office space for uh, Barbara Underwood, who is the uh, director of the of the recreation programs, and then upstairs. Uh, the nice big room, which is going to look just as it's always looked, will once again be available for community activities, and there'll be yoga classes. And because I'm a quilter, maybe there'll be quilting classes, and perhaps a book group will meet there. Uh, we might even have a wedding reception there. It's going, it's going to be available to serve the community as a, a an open meeting space where people can spill out of the doors into the park and it's going to be there for a long time. When you place a building that you cherish in a public a public place like a park, you know that it's going to be there for a long, long time.